Good morning. So now we come to our Gospel reading. So here, the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. And I'm reading from John chapter 12, beginning at verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say, Father? save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Open our hearts and our minds to hear what you want to say to us today by the power of your spirit. Amen. Um, I'm aware that some of what I say might seem a bit controversial to some people. If you have any issues with, with my message today, please do just get in touch and we can talk about it. So as always with John's Gospel, there's a lot going on in just these few verses. First of all, we have some Greeks, so that is Gentiles, come seeking out Jesus, which is a sign of things to come and how the word would be spread beyond the boundaries of Palestine and Judaism. Jesus then speaks of the glory that God the Father will give him. He refers to his forthcoming death and reveals his anguish at what awaits him. He challenges his followers and would-be followers, saying that we must be prepared to give up our life in order to gain real life. He speaks of the coming hour of judgment and he makes this extraordinary statement. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. I have often pondered on what this means. Who is Jesus referring to as the ruler of this world? Isn't God supposed to be the one in charge, the ruler? So if Jesus isn't talking about God as the ruler of this world, who does he mean? We naturally tend to think he must be referring to the devil, however you conceive of him, perhaps the, the force of evil that constantly seeks to overturn the will of God and to fight against the coming of God's kingdom here on earth. Many Christians believe that God's power is supreme, that he is 
the Almighty, that he directs all that occurs. So they believe that because God is God, then everything that happens must be God's will. Many non-Christians think this too, and, and for many people, it is in fact the reason why they reject the whole idea of this God and of Christianity and, and faith. And I can understand them. Famously, Stephen Fry, I understand, has said that he cannot believe in a God who allows children to suffer terrible diseases. And just recently, a lady said to me that what faith she had had before the pandemic had faded away completely because of this virus and the death and the suffering it has caused to so many people. If God is really the one in control, in charge of everything, why doesn't he just stop it? So where does that leave us? It's a particularly relevant question as we approach Good Friday and face the suffering of Jesus. Did he really go, as some hymns would tell us, cheerfully to the cross? I don't think the gospel accounts support that idea. They make it clear that Jesus is troubled, he is anguished, that he would like to avoid the agony that lies ahead. But, he says, not my will, but your will be done. So when Jesus says this, is he indicating that death on the cross is actually God's will for him? We often think of it that way. But perhaps what it means is that God's will, God's way of love and mercy and non-violence is what Jesus must do. And Jesus in his agony and dread is asking for the strength, for the resolution to remain firm in the stand that he's taking. Not to buckle under pressure or torture not to deny the way of love that he has spent his adult life demonstrating and teaching and preaching about. For me, this makes more sense than believing that God deliberately sent Jesus specifically to be killed. I do believe that God knew that that would happen. He knew that Jesus' message and challenge would be just too much for people and for the religious leaders to swallow and that they would try to do away with him, silence him and then be free to carry on as though he had never been. God could foresee that they would kill Jesus, but that doesn't necessarily mean that God willed Jesus' murder. Jesus remained true to his father, true to the way of love, and the people had him crucified. Was that God's will being done? With this pandemic that we're going through, is God's will being done? Did God really send this awful virus to punish us or to make us think harder about matters of life and death? Does God send us the other diseases and disasters that hit us and shatter our lives, our hopes and dreams? Do they come from God? Do the bad things happen on God's orders to teach us a lesson? Well, I don't believe so. I note sayings like this one of Jesus, about the ruler of this world now being cast out. I note Jesus telling us to pray that God's will might be done on earth as it is in heaven, implying clearly that God's will isn't always being done on earth. And I think of St Paul in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 6 where he says, for our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, 
against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That is a fairly scary list and I confess I don't know exactly what St Paul is referring to. But I do recognise in those words the sense of a presence of evil among us. We see this at its worst in some of the barbaric acts carried out by extremist groups and even some governments, as well as by individuals. And I'm sure we all know in ourselves at times the impulse to do or to say what we know is not right or pleasing to God. Sometimes we fight against it, sometimes, sadly, we give in. And let's hear St Paul again in Romans chapter 7. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. We all know that we don't always do God's will. So why should we imagine that everything that happens is because God has willed it? So if all the bad stuff that happens is not God's will, but happens because we are subject to some evil force that seems to be at work in the world and even in ourselves, where does this leave God? Is our God not the omnipotent one, the all-powerful ruler over everything? And if we decide that God is not all-powerful and in control of everything, then is there no hope? Oh yes, there is hope because of Jesus, because although he died, that was not the end of him as the authorities had hoped and expected. Because Jesus's life was totally surrendered to the Father, because he was utterly filled with the power of God's Holy Spirit, through him God could cast out the ruler of this world and make Jesus victorious. God overpowered the forces of evil that would stifle the love that Jesus had shown. And God showed that he had won this victory by raising Jesus to new life in the resurrection. You may remember the words of the song, The Lord of the Dance. I'm going to say them now. I danced on the Sabbath and I cured the lame. The holy people said it was a shame. They whipped and they stripped and they hung me on high and they left me there on the cross to die. I danced on a Friday when the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. They buried my body and they thought I'd gone, but I am the dance and I still go on. They cut me down and I leapt up high. I am the life that will never, never die. I'll live in you if you'll live in me. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. Because God has shown us that life, shown us his ultimate power over evil, we can trust that God will be with us as he was with Jesus. We can trust that when we suffer, he will be with us and lead us through the pain. And we can trust that out of our disasters, if we allow him, he will bring some good, some hope, some change in the way we see the world and each other. He will not leave us hanging on our cross forevermore. We may go through our own Good Fridays, but Easter Sunday always awaits us. Because he is faithful and because we now know that the ruler of this world has been cast out and will not have the last word. So we have hope in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.